the boxer in me was just like, don't let them see you cry. <laughs> don't let them see you cry. Welcome to Sky Sports Real Talk, a brand new series where we'll be deep diving into topics that aren't often spoken about in a sporting context. You'll hear sports people talk like you've never heard them before. When he died, obviously a part of me died. This intrusive thought popped into my head. Everyone tells you about being assaulted was true. Like, I just didn't know what to do. Join me, Miriam Walker-Khan, for Real Talk. Hello, this is Tom Cheshire on the Sky News Daily, standing in for Neil Patterson. On this episode, we're delving into whether the UK is really ready for a war. Now, given we spend more than £50 billion a year, more than 2% of GDP on defence, you'd hope the answer would be yes, but it's not that straightforward. So our defence and security editor, Deborah Haynes, has spent a lot of time considering exactly this question. Deborah, why? Well, we don't have a plan. We don't have a national defence plan. And the government is saying how we're living in an increasingly dangerous world as we did during the Cold War. But back then, there was a plan for all of this. And right now, we don't have one. So that's what I've been looking into. That's not very reassuring, but we've got you here. And joining us too is Rob Clark. He served in the army in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And he's now an army reservist. He's also policy director at the Policy Institute, Curia. Deborah, can we start? painting a picture of what is quite a hostile world. We think the Russia-Ukraine war still going at loggerheads all these years in. You've got Israel Hamas, the wider Middle East uncertainty. We've seen with, you know, whether Iran might escalate. China, we look at what's happening there in terms of their belligerence around Taiwan or what they're doing to Filipino ships. And that's actually really powerful. That You could easily see a conflagration there. How dangerous is the world right now? Really dangerous. And the Defence Secretary, actually, who hasn't been in the job, relatively speaking, very long, in January said we're moving from a post-war to a pre-war world. And he talked about within five years there being multiple theatres, and you can only extrapolate, of conflict in China, North Korea, Iran, and of course Russia, war in Europe on a scale that hasn't been seen since 1945. And of course, the Middle East in flames. Any one of those different crises contained at the moment within the borders that they're being contained within could spark either by accident or by design into a global war. And can, we, can we drill down where that might come from? Iran, North Korea, you know, familiar to us from the old axis of evil uh, back in the George Bush days when he was president. But adding Russia and China in the mix, those are two big, big militaries. What are the sort of specific things? There? Is it technological threats? Is it where they are? Is it how the war might start? What are we looking at? It's a challenge to the fundamental uh, existence and world norms and rules that we've all grown up with since the end of the Second World War. That's what's happening right now. So the assumption that Western countries have enjoyed, really, for the last few decades, that life as they know it under the rule of law with liberal democracies, economic growth, uh, you know, by and large, can happily continue. It's being contested by authoritarian regimes. And they have, unlike Western countries, invested very heavily and strategically in their armed forces, China in particular. Russia, they are ramping up weapons production on a scale that European countries can only stand and and watch by, and also relying on Iran, North Korea, to help rearm them. And so it's a different level of military power and willingness to use it in a hostile way. And that's what leaders today are grappling with. Because we just simply haven't had that since the Second World War, even something like the Korean War wouldn't... Well, since the Cold War. I mean, in the Cold War, you have to remember that those days were absolutely dominated by the fear of nuclear annihilation. Uh, The Second World War, that use was at a time when only one country had nuclear arms. Now we're in a world where there are several countries that have nuclear weapons and the actual blast capacity, the destructive force of these nuclear weapons today are on a magnitude that is incomparable in terms of scale to what we saw used in Japan. There was a choreography when dealing with the Warsaw Pact countries 
Each side had large armed forces at a high level of readiness and they spoke to each other in a language they understood and there was a way to deal with moments of tension, moments of potential escalation and there was also a buffer between the conventional forces, the large-scale high readiness conventional forces and nuclear Armageddon. Since the end of the Cold War, when all of that thinking, at least on the Western side, has fallen away and the size of the conventional militaries, such as here in the UK, has significantly contracted, there's less of a buffer and there's not been as much attention given to that threat of nuclear annihilation that maybe should begin to happen, given the threats from Russia. And when you say that, that choreography is not just choreography. We used to have a specific plan. And that's what your sources are saying we just don't have now, which seems pretty extraordinary. It blew my mind, frankly. We've been looking at the state of the UK armed forces. They get a lot of money invested into them. Uh, there's been lots of procurement disasters. The money's not spent as well as it should be. Government decisions over time on the armed forces have been questionable and they've been wanting the military to do more with less. And that's no secret. You know, obviously, there's a, an absolute need to invest in our defences, given the threats that we've just talked about. But then, you you know, looking at the actual state of, of defence and what it's designed for, I was speaking to different sources and it became apparent that we don't actually anymore have a national defence plan. We absolutely rely on our nuclear weapons to deter threats because obviously we have that ability to respond with nuclear force. And as importantly as that, our membership of the NATO alliance. And NATO has a huge war plan. Of course it does. It's, that's its entire raison d'etre, is to defend the alliance. But back in the Cold War days, NATO had its plans. But the UK also had a national plan. It was called the Government War Book. And it had different levels of things to do, lists really, a to-do list in the event of potential war that would complement the NATO alert. So the NATO alert would go up and the the UK alert would also go up. I mean, these plans were, they're meticulous. They, were, they range from anything from mobilising the reserves to removing artwork from London to put them somewhere more protected and everything in between from closing hospitals uh, or you know, evacuating hospitals of anyone but the most sick, obviously closing schools, dealing with securing the ports, food supply, water supply, putting industry on a war footing so you could produce the weapons that you need. This isn't something that defence alone ever did. It's a whole of society. It's a whole of society thing. And we seem to have just completely lost that. Let's bring in Rob Clark now, because you are an army veteran. You're now the policy director at Curia. And given, given your experience in recruitment, why do you think we are where we are uh, in terms of UK preparedness, in terms of what Deborah's outlined there? I joined the army at uh, 19 years old. I quit university during the height of the Iraq war to serve in Iraq. Uh, I stayed in for uh, tours of Afghanistan and then I left in 2014 and I joined the Army Reserves where I still serve now, mainly as a recruiter uh, and I train reservist recruits. In terms of the, the UK's effort for preparedness, there's a, obviously a huge buzzword going around, which is resiliency and national resiliency. But we're really missing the key systems and architecture which enable resiliency, which authoritarian governments like China, like Russia, can enact very quickly simply because they aren't beholden to uh, liberal democratic values such as we are in the West. And we can see that here in the UK quite readily in terms of the, the lack of the ability to mobilise the armed forces at a time of great crisis. We have done in the past, but not since the Second World War. And we can see that very easily today. For instance, we have the reserves and we've also got the strategic reserves. Now, the strategic reserves is where in the event of a great crisis or a great war, the idea on paper is that we can draw recent service leavers. So military personnel from all branches who have left the military within around eight years, they're still liable for calling up in times of national emergency and war. However, having spoken quite recently to several former colleagues and friends who, who left the armed forces, not, not a single one of them have 
notified either the Ministry of Defence or rather the department getting in touch with them to see about their contact details are still correct and up to date. Simple things like uh, the ability to communicate with these personnel in order to uh, draw them up in times of crisis. So that's a huge disadvantage when it comes to things like national resiliency and mobilisation for our armed forces and the, the, the wider reserve forces. And then we can see parallels with the rest of Europe. Just to use Finland as a a very quick example, their overall reserve forces are around 900,000. Now, to put that into context, the Finnish population is around five and a half million. So if the UK were able to draw on the same national resiliency and framework for mobilisation, we would be able to draw on a reserve force of around four and a half million, which is understandably uh, probably quite unrealistic. Finland's obviously shaped by its, uh, you know, its very long border with Russia and its history with Russia. If, if we're doing other comparisons, and I think, you know, the comparison should always be France, right? From a military perspective, it's always been who we've measured ourselves against um, since, you know, Agincourt and before that, uh, through the Napoleonic Wars. And that's slightly in jest, but for a bigger country, we've also got our own advantages. We're an island. Do we need to necessarily be like Finland and have that bigger uh, reserve force? Because that is a lot. We're a bigger country. We're a bigger economy. We've got nuclear weapons. And that's for both you. Do we want to model ourselves on Finland? Do we want to be closer to France, which has but a bigger arm? It's important arm? to mention, like France, that conscription only ended in France in 1997. It has a very different approach to, you know, it's like an allergic reaction over here, the word conscription. Um, we had the the Latvians reintroducing conscription recently in the wake of what happened in Ukraine. And uh, then suddenly our... Yeah, and then our head of our army made this very important speech where he talked about civilians training civilians for war and how you know armies start wars and civilians end them, which obviously is what you're seeing in Ukraine with all the civilians that have been mobilised. And then the chief of the defence staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radican, came out in a subsequent speech and said, nobody's talking about conscription. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a bit of an immature A conversation, I think, in the UK. Rob, can you break down the reasons, economic reasons, political reasons, why the UK doesn't have that level of preparedness? There's really sort of three main reasons. These can be broken down into economic pressures, political pressures, ideological reasons as well within the government. So short term, we've got obviously the energy cap, the pension triple lock, for instance, tax cuts. Um, These all are placing immense economic pressure on the government to not increase defence spending and concentrate more on the domestic, political and economic agenda, particularly as we gear into a general election. More longer term, there's immense borrowing and debt incurred, obviously, from the furlough scheme and the longer lasting impact of COVID. Uh, And obviously the war in Ukraine as well, which the UK is spending between two and two and a half billion pounds a year mainly out of the Ministry of Defence budget for supplementals, which is uh, additional costs. The political pressures are a little bit more nuanced. Uh, Defence has never really been viewed as as an election year policy. Uh, And then finally, the ideological reasons why we're not really uh, investing or we're not really prepared to invest in in defence. Both the Chancellor and the Prime Minister uh, have insisted that defence spending will rise, but uh, the economic stability growth is a prerequisite for that increased spending on defence. Rob, how do we fix that? You know, given that reaction to the very idea of conscription, when it was mentioned and shouted down, as Deborah was saying, how how do you change that mindset? How do you change those sort of recruitment methods? Going forwards, in terms of developing capability and resiliency uh, and therefore deterrence, the whole point is to deter war rather than actually fight it, which is infinitely more costly, uh, we do have to increase spending. And this comes back to the wider political debate, which is incredibly timely at the minute regarding uh, defence spending. And really, I think the the key thing to do here is to move away from the conversation of, uh, you know, 2.5% of GDP or 3% of GDP, uh, as, as useful benchmarks as they are, and they help the conversation. Really, we have to have a capability assessment um, of our armed forces and where these enormous black holes in capability lie. At the moment, we have armed forces that have been shaped and designed by financial envelopes as opposed to a a genuine assessment. If you want to look at the fact that we live in a pre-war world, as the Defence Secretary has said, and what that then means in terms of the kind of armed forces that you need. Our air defences, for example, they're practically non-existent. We have warships called Type 45 destroyers that are equipped with the air defence systems that can protect us from incoming fast missiles. But 
that has to be in the right place. It's not very heartwarming. I mean, isn't that, isn't that the counter argument to all of this that, you know, generals are always going to want more soldiers, admirals are going to want more ships and um, destroyers. But given that we already spent more than £50 billion pounds and we're still in this state and the armed force is just asking for more money when it, but they haven't even the ar- matched the capability yet. But that's the thing, though, isn't it? It's not the armed forces. We're talking about the whole of society. What people are talking about in terms of this national defence plan, of course, the Ministry of Defence and the military is part of it. But it's something that historically has been led by the prime minister and the cabinet office. It's a central government, all of nation effort. And yes, it means it would cost more money. But if you're thinking about building up deterrence, genuine deterrence, credible military with the capacity to fight an enduring operation, an industrial base that actually can build the weapons that then would be needed to arm any civilians that then decide decided they wanted to go in and fight, um, then it's it's an effort that the entire nation um, should be supporting if that's what they believe. I, I suppose the question then becomes, if, if that worst case scenario is to happen, that industrial base you're talking about in particular, is that even possible these days? Well, that's the question we were asking. And we decided to go back to the 1930s, the last time we were five years before a war in a pre-war world, to use the Defence Secretary's words. And the government of the day um, came up with a plan. It was called a shadow scheme. They could see the threat of war with Germany looming. They could see that their industrial base was not sufficient to be able to build the weapons that needed, the aircraft in particular. And these shadow factories were then built really rapidly. There was one in Castle Bromwich in Birmingham, um, and it was uh, farmland, it was countryside. And within months, they built up this enormous factory um, to build Spitfires. And by the end of the war, um, this facility had built almost 12,000 Spitfires. I mean, the RAF would just be like, you know, dribbling with excitement at the idea of even a fraction of that number. Uh, over the course of 20 years, let alone 12,000 in such a, well, almost 12,000 in such a small, short space of time. It shows that we can do it. Of course, we import a lot of our weapons, um, our steel industry, the heavy industries that provide the raw material that you need, like the explosives that you need for ammunition. We're seeing a huge problem with that now in terms of even trying to rearm Ukraine with the artillery and the ammunition that it needs to fight. People are talking about this, but uh, the criticism is it's not happening at the speed um, of relevance. Let's just take a quick pause there. And after the break, we'll look at what the UK should be thinking about to make sure the nation is ready for war. We're back with our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, and army reservist, Rob Clark. Rob, we've talked about threats and weaknesses in our current defence and security funding. But when it comes to being an army reservist and training reservists, what are the sorts of changes that need to be made? I see the reserves as a national capability completely stand alone to the British Army. The whole point of the Army Reserve is to backfill British Army uh, headcount and gaps. Army 2030, for instance, had a policy where one third of all British Army deployments would be from the Army Reserve. And I see that day in, day out, year in, year out, that it is not even close to hitting that target. Now, there's a multitude of reasons for this. So the Army Reserve currently have a number of around 27,000 personnel. It's a very skewered perception of the capability the the Army Reserve have. And that requires fundamental changes in both structure uh, and appeal uh, for people joining the Army Reserve. I think separately, the Army Reserve really should be this like like a national resilience force or like a home guard where we could see just how intrinsic both the Army and the Army Reserve were during for instance, the COVID pandemic and things like the NHS strikes, the border force strikes. So we can see the need uh, from a domestic angle, from a domestic resilience perspective, to have a greater uh, incorporation of uh, particularly the reserves. If we think about getting ready for war, is there a danger that, as you say, Deborah, this, this would cost money, a war book you know, costs money to run? Where do we get the line right on deterrence? You know, if it never happens, people say, why do we spend money on it? But actually, you could bankrupt yourself getting ready for a war that never comes. So how do you strike that balance? Deterrence, when it works, 
means that nothing happens. So you, know, you could argue that it has worked and the investment was worthwhile, but you've got nothing to show for it because the war never happened. I think the the sense from everybody that I'm speaking to or I've been speaking to, um, looking at the, the threat landscape um, and the unpredictability of, um, of, of the different powers that are involved, that the sort of the policy seems to have been in government that deterrence will work in the form of the nuclear arsenal that we have, this submarine that is permanently, with four submarines, nuclear armed, one is permanently at sea, ready to, de to deploy nuclear weapons in the defence of this nation, then, and then the membership of NATO, that that deterrence is enough, which means that it, it, it won't fail but then they don't ask the question, what if it fails? And that's the question now people say must be asked. I ought to as well just bring in what the government has said in response to our reporting on all of this, because obviously I had to go to them and ask them about how these allegations that we don't have a defence plan. The Cabinet Office said that the country has robust plans in place for a range of potential emergencies and scenarios with plans and supporting arrangements developed, refined and tested over many years. And it goes on to, the, the spokesperson lists various issues like the, the Government Resilience Framework, a National Risk Register, there's these local resilience forums but I, which is, you know, it's all very true. Sounds that very have, reassuring. It's, it sounds, and it says but it's part, a part of a broad emergency response capabilities. All local resilience forums have plans in place to respond to a range of scenarios and the government continues to review the risk landscape, including threats from overseas. But I flicked through the risk register and it offers a lot more information on floods, pandemics, terrorism and cyber attacks than it does about the event of World War Three, for example. And I also contacted a number of these local resilience forums and they did confirm that they themselves, these local forums, don't have specific plans for war. They rely on central government for that, uh, which seems is maybe scrambling to now draw one up, hopefully. Fail to plan, plan to fail, as the phrase goes. Rob Clark, Deborah Haynes, thank you very much indeed.